Welcome to Global Digest, a light-hearted look at current affairs around the world. I am Ama Marcus. Well, today we begin our report from the Middle East, where Israel's military has denied attacking a tent camp. Now, this happened in the west of Rafa on Tuesday. Now, this comes after Gazan Health authorities said the Israeli tank fire killed at least 21 individuals in an area designated to be a civilian evacuation zone. Well, earlier, Israel had defied an appeal from the International Court of Justice and Israeli tanks are still advancing into the heart of Rafa. Now, this is for the first time after a night of heavy bombardment. Now, this is happening. Meanwhile, Spain, Ireland and Norway officially recognized a Palestinian state. Now, this has deepened Israel's international isolation. Well, joining us this morning is Ambassador Joe Keshi. He is a retired Nigerian diplomat. He served at various foreign missions, including the Nigerian consulate in Atlanta, Georgia, where he was the consul general. Well, he joins us today and he will be giving us an appraisal of the tense situation between Israel, Hamas and, you know, the Middle Eastern region. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Amma, for having me. So, Ambassador, um, well... Uh, Israeli officials claim they did not uh, organize the latest strike that happened in the Gaza Strip. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Palestinian officials are saying 21 people have been killed. Now, the U.S. also does not believe that Israel you know, has launched this invasion, especially after the ICC ruling. Now, what does this mean for the future of the conflict? Does this mean Israel would keep on bombing the region and you know, anything goes? Well, first of all, I'm not too sure if they are saying that... Um they were not responsible for the disaster, the bombing, because the Prime Minister himself has admitted that it was a tragic mistake. And if the tri Prime Minister says it was a tra tragic mistake, it simply means that uh, they did it. And what the Americans have, um, have uh, also tried to say was that uh, this is exactly what they've been trying to tell the Israelis that they should not carry out any operation in the Rafa, you know, area. Because not only is it overpopulated, I mean, not only is it uh, highly populated, uh, that the people of um, the Palestinians who live in the Gaza area, that they are really tired and fed up of, you know, moving from one place because of the Israeli, um, uh, you know, uh, attack. But look, but for me, I, I just think that, you know, sometimes I ask myself, how would, at the end of the day, how would God judge this generation, the people of this world, and in particular the leaders, as we watch this senseless killing, you know, which for me absolutely is no longer um, uh, necessary. But here, you know, you find people, you see people, particularly uh, children just being given birth to, being killed by air bombardment and women and, you know, innocent people dying for what they cannot even explain. They are not part of the Hamas, uh, Israel problem and so on. And, and by the way, you know, most people do not realize that Hamas was not that a popular organization within Gaza itself. But here, Hamas created a problem, yes, but we should not condemn Hamas in isolation of what Israel has been doing over the last 70 years in that part of the world. So it, it's a tragedy that the world is uh, witnessing, and uh, it looks as if we are all completely helpless. Because, as I always put it, when you go after Israel, when you attack Israel, when you put pressure on Israel, everybody now begins to say, oh, you know, um, you forgot saying that the Israelis suffered Holocaust, the Israelis uh, did this, they lost 70 million people uh, under Hitler and so on. And so all of us in the world today are being made to feel guilty of the Holocaust that we're not part of. Uh, but nobody has ever made we Africans feel that same way when you consider that over a hundred and something million people were lost during the slave trade, perpetrated by the West today. So you can see the, the hypocrisy of the West to accept they are very soft on Israel, but they are quick to condemn others. 
Look at how the Americans, the West, de are dealing with uh, Russia over Ukraine. Compare mm -hmm. that to what they are doing today with regards to Israel. But as I said, we all leave that to the judgment of God. But I have a very strong feeling that the leaders of today who keep quiet in the face of death and destruction in the Gaza Strip, for whatever reason, will not, will not certainly escape the judgment of God for their silence. Speaking of Asia now, Asia wants an international rule-based system of government. Now, the international courts, the United Nations, they have all been calling for a ceasefire and none of these have been applicable. They have not been recognized by Israel in any way. So we're looking at the prime minister now. It seems he's really bent and intent on, you know, running Hamas out of the Gaza Strip. Well, he did say at the beginning of the war that that was his intention. So he is going ahead to not recognize his international-based rules. You know, what could this mean? Israel has never believed in international peace rules. Israel, you know, plays by its own rule, mm. period. Secondly, I have, I'm one of those who holds the current prime minister responsible for this crisis. Because of his ambition to, to now, initially he wanted to be the longest serving prime minister in the history of Israel. And as a result, he went into alliance with the far right, the extreme right political parties. Now, these are a group of religious-based um, characters who do not believe that even a stitch of the land should be considered to the Palestinians. As far as they are concerned, the whole land, even extending to Jordan and far beyond, is the land that God gave them and they want it all back. As we speak, some of them are even arguing today that they need to occupy and take over Gaza completely. But the Prime Minister, in order to become the longest serving Prime Minister, and now, in addition to that, because he wants to escape being going to jail for some of the accusations against him, which is in court, he has now decided to make this war you know, uh, a saving grace as the guy who saves Israel from destruction and so on. But in the process, he has created more problems for Israel. Look, bear this in mind. There's no way Hamas can be destroyed. If you doubt me, ask the Americans. Did they destroy the Taliban? No. How much did they spend trying to destroy the Taliban? So when the president of Israel, Joe Biden, says to the, Israel, to the Israelis, learn from the mistakes we made in okay. Afghanistan and in Iraq, it is a direct way of saying, we spent more than 20 years, spent over 70, almost seven trillion dollars and at the end of the day, we abandoned the place and the Taliban came back to power. And I always add that no group of people in this world have embarked on fighting for a cause that they believe in, that is just. They have never lost. They have never lost. It might take 100 years, but they will win. Before we came on air, we were discussing South Africa. Remember at one time, the world, the West, described Mandela as uh, a terrorist. Yes. ANC was virtually banned from South Africa. Mm -hmm. But who ruled South Africa today? ANC. After how many years? They won. So the people of Palestine, one day, will have their state of their own. Mm -hmm. It might not be in a lifetime, but it will happen. It's inevitable. It will happen. Speaking of the state of Palestine having a state of their own, could you enumerate on the two-state solution that is being pushed through at the United Nations? Look, it's been on the table for over 40 years, this two-state solution. The unfortunate thing was that when it was first muted, both sides rejected it. Somewhere along the line, you know, everybody began to look at it as the best solution. Because, it, look, by the way, you know, these are two uh, children of Abraham. 
And if you read the Bible and you see how stubborn that generation, how they were, you can understand what's going on today. So they reject. But now, when you look at the whole crisis, there's no other way but having Israel and the state of Palestine and the guaranteeing the security of Israel as well as the security of the people of Palestine. For now, that is the only solution anybody serious, seriously considering end, you know, ending the crisis can put on the table. Mm. Now, if we can get them to end the war and then begin to talk seriously, unfortunately, because again, the prime minister of Israel wants to remain prime minister, he's not ready or he lacks the courage to take that risk and commit himself to a two-state solution. Because if he does that, this government, the Israeli current government will collapse. Will collapse. And he does not want to go because if he goes this time, the chances are that uh, his trial will resume and he could go to jail. Well, Spain, Norway, and Ireland have moved to recognize, uh, you know, uh, Gaza as a Palestinian state. Of course, they want to recognize as Palestinian states. We've, we've spoken about that. But um, will this move in any way help in the progression of the war, maybe to a peaceful resolution or maybe to a ceasefire? I think the only way it will help is if more countries take the same step. Mm. I actually believe that uh, the whole of African states should come around collectively and recognize the state of Palestine, as we did when we recognized the uh, Sahara Arab, um, Arab Republic. But the truth of the matter is that, except the world seriously, but especially the West, engage and pressurize Israel, Israel under Prime Minister Netanyahu will never stop its activities in the Gaza Strip. Mm. And we need to recognize that, look, more and more people, innocent people are dying for what they can't even understand. You know, <laughs> these were people who were, who were just sleeping, enjoying their, their life as bad as it was then. And suddenly, bombs began to you know, descend on them simply because Hamas invaded uh, yeah. Israel, which we all condemned that that was not the right thing to do. Now, Hamas killed about, uh, um, how many people, 100 and something, mm -hmm. and took uh, 200 and something hostages. As of soldier. today, how many has Israel killed? Over 20 something, or close to 30,000 people. How do you justify, I mean, the gap between 1,000 and 30,000 is certainly too high. So you spoke on African countries coming together to, you know, try and make a move and recognize the states. Well, South Africa is doing same at the International Criminal Court where they have brought a genocidal case. You know, they've opened it over Asia. Well, the United States has slammed it and said that the ICC should be punished for, you know, enacting sanctions on, you know, uh, Israel and also calling for the arrest of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. This, this is where international politics is interesting. The Americans have never supported and they are not, I'm not even sure they're members of the International Court. They are yeah, not. not. You know, this court was set up ostensibly to deal with uh, third world countries and possibly Russian folks. Now that they are beginning, the current uh, prosecutor general is, is going beyond that and then dealing with a member of that Western group they are now beginning to say that, ah, look, this court is dangerous. Mm. Because the same people wanted um, uh, Putin. Yes. I'm not even sure if, they were, if Putin was not, uh, I can't remember now. He was, he was. Exactly. The court came yes. out and condemned and Good. called for his arrest as well. Good. So, you see, it was okay mm. for Putin to be arrested for doing what? For bombing and invading, right. you know. Right. But it's not okay for Israel. And, and this, is the, the, this is the hypocrisy of the West that is so glary that the West is not even ashamed when they take this double, you know, I mean, this, uh, when they speak from the two sides of, the, uh, of their mouth. Sometimes I even think that Western leaders, particularly American leaders, that they think that the rest of us are idiots. 
that we are dumb, that we can't remember what they said yesterday. So they are free to, to say something today and say another thing tomorrow. No, it, the International Court of Justice did the right thing by insisting that uh, these gentlemen, including the Hamas folk, should be arrested anywhere they go to. Look, it will not help, but the international community as a global body must continue to put pressure on Israel. The Israelis, as a people, are very stubborn. Very, very stubborn. Go read the Bible. You see the headache they gave God. You see the headache they gave uh, Abraham, I mean, um, uh, what's his name? Um, who led them out of Egypt now? Moses. Moses. You said even, uh, you know, so it's recorded. But the only way out is for the world to continue to pressurize them to be rational, to be reasonable. And as Biden once said, not to allow their rage to overcome their rationality. Because at the end of the day, it is impossible. Look, anywhere in the world you find people fighting a just cause. The Americans spent how many years in Vietnam? How many thousands of soldiers did they lose in Vietnam? At the end of the day, they lost. They lost. They went to Iraq, they lost. They went to um, Afghanistan, they lost. The French spent many years in Afghanistan, they lost. You can, I can begin to tell you countries that have tried this kind of thing, they lost. The whole of the Western, you know, that colonized Africa. And then they thought that, uh, look, we're animals, we can't rule ourselves, they need to civilize us at the end of the day. After many years, they packed their bag and baggages, they left. We won. So and people with just cause or causes would always win at the end of the day. No matter how long it takes, they will win. And I'm sure it might not be in my lifetime. You never know what could happen. But the truth of the matter is that one day there will be a state of Palestine. So let's look at the regional effects of this conflict in the Middle East. So we're seeing, you know, strikes in Lebanon where Israel is saying they were targeting Hamas leaders in other places. We saw the other retaliatory strikes, you know, that happened within Iran and Israel. This is seeming to encapsulate the rest of the region. You know, of course, we already had in reports of a run-in with the Qatari government through uh, Al Jazeera where, you know, the... The, you know, the complex or the space they were using was raided. You know, so Israel is having you know, run-ins with governments of other regions. Does this speak well for the future, say, post-conflicts? You know, I sometimes believe that it would have been easier to manage Israel, to persuade Israel, if the Arab nations, if they have stood together as a body and collectively challenge Israel. But unfortunately, they are all too comfortable in their wealth to want to jeopardize what they are enjoying for the sake of their brothers and sisters in, uh, in Palestine. If not, look, Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, has spent more money than any of those countries in purchasing uh, American, uh, air, I mean, uh, aircrafts, uh, military aircrafts. So they have enough aircraft if they really want to fight. Uh, not to talk of, uh, of course, Iran has developed its own uh, military capabilities. You have Egypt. Egypt does not even want to get involved militarily mm. because of its past experience, you know. So you find a situation where they are ready to offer assistance. They are ready to spend some money to rebuild Gaza. But if they had come together as a body and said to Israel, no, we cannot allow this to happen in our region, maybe the Israelis would rethink because it would be very difficult at this point in time for Israel to fight all these countries. 
because the international community will be scared of the fact that this war could expand beyond where they are. For example, if, every, if, if um, Iran, Syria, and the rest decide to go into war, as we speak, nobody knows what the Russians will do. But these are allies of the Russians. You understand? So it's a dicey situation. But I believe that if the Arabs come together and work together and begin to challenge Israel that enough is enough, we break diplomatic relations. We no longer recognize you. We are ready to even put our, commit our own armed forces. You will see a different scenario emerging in the global community. Everybody will run, you know, to begin to see how they can lower the temperature and stop the expansion of the war to involve the whole region. But as long as nobody's in that region is directly charged, look, the Rafa area, it's the border between uh, um, Egypt and, uh, you know, and yet here they are coming so close to the Egyptian border and the Egyptians, you know, they are just angry with themselves and saying that this will be disastrous, this will be this. And no, if you have put your military there and said no, this, this is a red line. If you cross this red line, the whole thing will change. Mm -hmm. The Israelis will consider whether they want to go to war with more countries or not. Mm -hmm. I might be proposing, uh, putting on table a hypothetical case, but why not? So let's look at the humanitarian, you know, catastrophe that this whole conflict you has. Really say it's, a, it's a catastrophe, it's a disaster. Because, look, I make the point, the Israelis as of today are a different, a different, they have a different mindset. They do not give a damn about how many people they kill. They believe that they, they can, they can kill all, everybody. In fact, they tell us that they have killed 70 or 80,000, I mean, 8,000 uh, Hamas operat operatives. But you know, if you take it that a military battalion is about uh, 800 to 900, it now means that they have destroyed close to 8 to 9 to 10 battalions of Hamas fighters. And then the question is, <laughs> how many of these? That's you are looking at 9,000. So if you have destroyed, so I mean, uh, 9,000 Hamas operatives, by now you should have finished killing uh, right. <laughs> every Hamas uh, operatives in that uh, part of the world. Mm. So extract that from the close to 30,000 people you have killed. How do you justify that? It's very difficult to justify that. Mm. What still is that? The whole of the infrastructure has been destroyed. The farm, businesses, everything destroyed. People can't even make, they, no market to buy anything from. So they have to depend on humanitarian assistance to come into the region. Here again, the Israelis are not allowing these things to flow into Gaza. In law, I think they call it double jeopardy. They are being bombarded from the air. Humanitarian assistance cannot get to them. So people are dying from military power. Many are also dying from hunger, particularly the, 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 the kids. Well, speaking of, you know, the children dying from hunger, the United Nations has raised alarm over and over on the humanitarian crisis and they're talking of aid, but somehow it's still not getting to the needed population. It's still not getting because Israelis have made it challenging. You can't be moving. Uh, look, if you are, if you are, um, uh, if you are involved in the distribution of uh, humanitarian uh, goods, and the whole place is being bombarded, how do you distribute these goods? You can't. But number one, number two, they are not even getting in, and the the, the important things like um, diesel and petrol to power the hospitals are not being allowed in. I mean, look. You know, again, I go back to what I said before. Um, it's so sad that the world is, is allowing this tragedy, this disaster, to happen in a place like, uh, like uh, Gaza. And this is the same, you know, Americans that went to 
Eastern Europe, when Yugoslavia was falling apart and the people were killing themselves, this is the same people that went to Rwanda and said the killing was enough. And here they are, everybody is just silent, and, and every day they hear television reporting of the dead, 27 people dying today. They see the statistics of 30,000 people killed, and people are still unable to find a way to resolve the crisis. So what would you say it's a way forward, you know, to push for a permanent ceasefire? Because Israel is still holding out, saying it still has, Hamas still has some of Israelis who were held hostage. Number one, in the past, Israel have gone into the Gaza Strip to release its hostages taken by Hamas. Um, Hamas invaded Israel on the 7th of October last year and today we've gone uh, five months, we're entering the sixth month, so this is about the eighth month of the war itself. The Israelis have not been able to find one hostage alive. All they have found are some of the dead ones that they were responsible, some of them they were responsible for when they bombed where they were being kept. So if in seven months you have not found one hostage alive, alive conventional wisdom dictates that the way to get these hostages alive is to negotiate with Hamas. And by the way, look, people don't see the irony of this. You want to destroy Hamas, but you are negotiating with Hamas. <laughs> Does it make sense? You want to destroy Hamas, but you are negotiating with Hamas. So if you destroy every Hamas and you can't find your hostages, so where do they come from? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't make sense. It just shows you what is guiding the mindset of the Israeli leaders. Revenge. Anger. Rage. Ego. These are the things that is guiding them and, of course, personal ambition of the Prime Minister. Your Excellency, thank you so much for coming and, you know, talking to us on the, you know, war in Gaza and its effect. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. So we've been speaking with Ambassador Joe Kashi on the war in Gaza and, of course, its global ramifications as it affects the globe and, of course, everyone around. Well, uh, the program continues after this break. Do stay with us.